Hey, I'm Pete from PMG. Welcome back to the channel. Today's video, we're going to be giving you a bit of a workshop tour, a tour of our showroom, and then also introducing you to my personal cars and our plans with them over the next year. And then answering that question I get asked by customers all the time, and that is, how did you become a detailer? So one of the questions that customers ask us all the time is, how did you get into this? You know, what, what made you become a detailer, etc." And the simple thing is that it started as a hobby, but the truth is it started way, way back, way beyond that. And as kind of cheesy as it sounds, I think I was always kind of destined to do this job. Now, I have literally been a lifelong car fanatic, right from being a child, right the way back to literally a toddler. I have been obsessed with cars and cars have kind of been the basis of near enough every decision I've ever made in life. Good and bad, it's always been the want of cars or the chase of cars is what makes me do it. And really, I mean, that's what I work for, to make money, to buy cars, to spend modifying cars, 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 that, that really is my life, um, as sad as that is, but I get immense happiness out of it. But going all the way back to then, as a young guy, you know, a young boy that loved cars and loved being around cars, and I couldn't drive them, so I could clean them. I would wash and clean my dad's cars a lot, my mum's car and stuff as a kid. Um, well, when I was about 10 years old, I fixated on one particular car, and that was the classic Mini. And luckily, my dad um, surprised me, so I think I was in first year in school, so what's that make me, maybe 12 years old? And I came home from school one day and him and my granda had went and got me a little mini Mayfair from a scrapyard. So it had been rescued from a scrapyard. I think it was 250 quid and it was rotten, absolutely rotten. Um, but it was all mine. It was my own mini and I used to drive it up and down the driveway at home and we had a double garage and I could do a, a three point turn and spin the mini round in there. But it was red and it was faded red. Um, it, always bothered me so I get into the old good old fashioned teacup and would have been hand polished and try and get the colour back and dressing the tyres and you know reviving the trims. It doesn't matter that the A panels were literally hanging off the car and the, the, the little mini light wheels on it, the paint was flaking off and stuff, but it was my little mini. And I had a part time job and with the money I made from that job I was buying mini parts to, to restore that car. Um, ultimately make it my first car. Now, I didn't end up with that as my first car, but it did end up being my first ever proper build. And ever since then, minis have had a special place in my life, but that was sort of my first sort of experience of cleaning a car, you know, with the intention of restoring finishes and stuff. So beyond just washing them, but trying to do a bit more. And I also tried to do a few mechanical things with that job or with that little car and stuff. And that led on to basically me wanting to do more and more with cars. Now, I went to a grammar school. I was in absolutely no way interested in education. It wasn't that I didn't have the brains for it, but I just, I didn't really see the point in it. Um, I knew I wouldn't go to university. I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't a bookworm. And I also wasn't really into sport either. I was just cars, obsessed with cars. A lot of the teachers and stuff mistook that as me being lazy, but you know, I had a job from a very young age. I liked to work. Um, I knew that ultimately the motor trade was where I was going to end up working. And um, to do that, well, I'd get into a mini club at, at this stage, I actually ran my own mini club, um, even though I couldn't drive. I was still in school at the time. And through those uh, clubs and stuff, I got meeting people. And one of them is a guy called Andy Blair. He now runs a very successful body shop called WJ Blair's in Duke, just outside Ballyclare. And he would have restored classic minis in the evening times. Um, I would have went over and give him a hand and he would have taught me about doing metal work and restoration and stupid things like how night remorse worked. And, and just, I enjoyed being around them and round cars in that sort of environment. But ultimately, I wanted to be in the car sales. And 
you're not going to leave school at 16 and jump into the car sales job. So I thought, you know what, I'm definitely not going to stay on at school. It just, it wasn't for me, further education, absolutely not. But maybe tech would be, and maybe if I got some motor trade experience when I was a bit older and I had some experience in the motor trade, I could jump into car sales. So with Andy's guidance, I actually get into car body repair. I went to a tech called Blackwater House, which is no longer with us anymore. And I did my NVQ in car body repair. And the truth be told is I, I didn't really enjoy it, to be honest. And it wasn't, wasn't a natural talent for me. But I did enjoy cleaning cars. And when I went to be, do my apprenticeship, I was working for Wright's Accident Repair here. And the apprentices often get fired into the cleaning bay to help clean up the cars and get them handed back for a customer. And that's where I got to do it day in, day out. And I discovered I was actually pretty good at it. And I really enjoyed that. And I kind of sneaked away to work in the valet bay there as much as possible. So rather than doing any of the hands-on stuff with the cars, which I, I did do a bit, and I did learn skills that have served me to this day. That's where I first learned how to machine polish things was in the body shop environment. But I, it was the clean inside of it I really liked. That transformation before your very eyes, um, it just, I don't know, it just grabbed me. And, and I guess I'd always done a bit of it. So around then I started doing cleaning at home, doing homers, so it was really only family and friends cars. And it really was with very basic cleans. So washing, hoover and detar and hand polishing, that type of thing. And around maybe a year of doing that, the manager of the body shop came to me and pretty much said, you're an apprentice that's meant to be learning how to do body work. You're not meant to be cleaning cars. So we need you to get back to the tools again. And I really knew that that wasn't for me. I'd, I'd done enough of it. I had done my paperwork side of my NVQ and ticked that off. But to be a, you know, a time served was another few years in the making and earning a pittance a week to do something I hate. It just didn't make sense. So I got a job at a local Ford dealership to be their car valet or there. And I thought I'd really enjoy that. But the truth was, I didn't enjoy it at all. I only stuck it out for about a year. And the reason that I didn't enjoy it was that everything was half-assed. So I never got the polished cars. You know, it was very much washing them, hoovering them. The cars were a mess. Um, I remember the, the owner of that, that dealership used to sort of chew me out in front of customers that complained about the standard of, of their car not being cleaned properly that they'd just purchased. And I just had to get chewed out, but go along with it, even though it was I was never allowed to do it properly. It wasn't for me. And luckily, their cheap half-ass ways was using newspaper to clean ones, <laughs> just clean glass with, not even cloth, but literally newspaper. And I was taking a sheet of newspaper one day, went to scrumple it up, and there was a job ad and it was for a local car dealership called Feltholm Cars. They were looking for a car valeter. It was closer to where I lived at home with my parents. And I rang immediately um, and had an interview for that day. At that time, it was a really small dealership. They maybe had like 10 cars. And um, Philip was not long actually started opening that business himself. And we probably didn't have a car that was more than 10 grand, but that experience of working there really i learned so much from watching philip run a business and also it was a great team we all work well together i have so many happy memories of working there and i was able to use there at night time to do homers and that's basically when my interest and in actual detail developed so that would have probably been around 2005 where i was you know, I had got valeting to a good standard and I was very experienced at it. I could knock out sort of two, three, four cars a day to a really good dealership standard. And I was doing a bit of machine polishing, this and that. But I could never really understand how to eradicate swear marks properly. And then I remember finding detail in the world and that opened my eyes. It blew me away what people were doing with paint correction, things like that. So I had to have a go. Um, I slowly built up a good base of skills that I had from all the years of, of hands-on with all of the sort of basic cleaning things. And then my, I had a good basic experience of how to use a machine polisher. And back then, it was all rotary polishing. It wasn't DA polishing like it is now. But I had a good understanding of what to do. So I cracked into 
that and I felt it was great. It allowed me all the time in the world. I could order whatever products I wanted. I could spend time in the cards. At the end of the day, we got, we got cards that looked amazing. and Amazing cards always sell. But the other things I learned from that place was the value of hard work. Philip would have worked with us. It was only a small business and he was trying to grow it. And when I left, it, it grew into quite a big business. And, and since I've left, it's, it's grew even more again. But he was not afraid of getting stuck in and doing the hard work alongside us. And there was many nights where we were working to 10, 11, midnight, all sorts of ridiculous hours. But it was great fun. Everybody got on so well. We would have socialized outside of work and stuff as well. But I could see that the more the business was doing, he was reinvesting it, growing the business. And the hard work, really, there's no substitute for it. And you just have to put the graft in, and that's that. And I just started doing detail, proper detail, as a hobby then. And for a while, I used a garage that belonged to a friend of my parents. Um, then, actually, Philip ended up letting me use the workshop to, to do stuff in the evenings and weekends. And then the first recession happened. Um, Philip, who I would never say a bad word about, I really, really enjoyed my time working with him. And uncharacteristically, we actually had an argument one day. And I get it was probably the pressures of the fact that we'd went from selling quite a lot of cars and then the recession hit and things had majorly slowed down. But I was still quite busy with homers in the evening. At the end of the day, I was using his premises, his electricity, a lot of his products and equipment and stuff. And he called me on one day and he was like, no, no more. If, if you're wanting to keep doing this type of thing, you're going to have to get your own place to do it. And I did. I went that night and it was an old farmyard. And I sort of thought, if I'm going to invest in renting premises and buying a lot of this equipment, I'm just going to make a go of it. And I had enough trade contacts that at that stage it was like, I probably could have a small business. Then detailing wasn't like what it's, what it's known now. Like paint correction stuff was really unheard of. It was a market that didn't really exist. So we were part of the people that get in at the ground and were trying to build that up. So I knew that I needed trade contacts to get that sort of basic cleaning dealership work through the door that would pay me a wage, it would give me money to reinvest in the business, and then I could slowly build up on the detail work, and someday I would get to be doing the sorts of work that I dreamed of doing. So that first, it was a huge shed, and it didn't cost a lot a month, but it was in an old farmyard that was an absolute mess. There were other car businesses in it, and again, it was great crack. The, the other businesses and stuff, we had great fun all working alongside each other, but it definitely didn't lend itself to being a detail, you know, like what we do now on a, on a studio basis. So I decided I needed to have something more suitable, and I made my first big mistake in business. And that is I took on a premises that basically it was an old, old plate, an old like saddlery, like an old building, and it needed refurb, and I spent a lot of money refurbishing it. But unfortunately, the landlords of that building would take no responsibility for the actual building works involved with doing, you know, the wiring was a mess on it. Um, they rented out some of the space to a, a building company that was extending a small school at the time beside it, and it turned the yard into an actual building site. And with that, Cars couldn't even leave without getting covered in mud. It put people off making bookings. It just was a total and utter disaster. And it really hurt the business. Uh, I was thinking, I need to do something here. I, I, I spent all this money that, you know, took a long time to gather in the refurbishing this building into something that looked good, but really wasn't fit for purpose. At that time, then I went out to the States uh, on holiday, but I'd called them with Glossop, who are an unbelievable detail studio in Vegas. And we did a bit of work with them. And it really opened my eyes. I need to be in Belfast. So whenever I come home, that's exactly what I started to do. I looked for premises. And this is when we found here, the building that we're in now. Now, we moved into this building in 2015. So I think we're around three and a half years at the the first premises and then around a year just over a year at the second premises and then finally we moved up to here 2015 and we've been here ever since 
Now, when we moved into this building, it needed a huge amount of work. This building used to be a recording studio that had walls everywhere. It was all separated into different rooms. So there was a lot of work in getting it converted into a workshop. And I'm very lucky I had great help with my friends who put in the hard graft, um, helped me paint and decorate and get the place into a functional building. And we've just kind of improved upon it every year since then. I get a major refresh in about 2017. And it hasn't really had much in the way of, of refreshment since then. So one of 2024 plans is going to be getting this building up to, up to scratch again. And the reason it's kind of been delayed is because we have another building in the same, uh, same business park. And we've invested quite a bit of money in turning it into a showroom area. We'll explain a bit more about that whenever we do the walk around, but that's kind of the journey of PMG to this point. It's been a crazy, crazy almost 14 years. But now I'm doing what I love day in, day out. And we've been through so many changes as the years have went on. We went up to a team of six at one time, and now we're back down to a team of just me and my brother, Stevie, who you'll see on the channel from time to time, although he's a little camera shy. But now I am so much happier. We have a workload that we can manage, and we put out consistent, top-quality work. It's a lot less stress than what it was whenever we had a lot of people here and we had huge amounts of overheads to meet. The overheads are still pretty crazy, uh, but at least it's something a bit more manageable now. So yeah, we have a lot to do to this workshop. You'll have seen it in the videos, no doubt, to this stage, but we do have sort of plans to, to take it up a step, and then that's going to allow us to also introduce some new services. Hopefully that hasn't bored you too much so far. I'm going to show you a little bit of a workshop tour. I'm going to show you down below, and then I'm going to introduce you into some of my cards from my collection and um, you can see what you think. So no doubt this is a familiar sight to you guys if you watch any of our videos and this is basically where we do the bulk of all of our correction and coating work. And the reason for that is we have invested quite a bit in a proper lighting setup for back here. Lighting is absolutely essential for paint correction and that's why I don't think you can really do it properly mobile. You really need to have the right environment set up. So we have our lighting system where we have lamps up on both sides like that. And then we have some overheads. And then we also have some more overheads. And these are all independently switched. So depending on what way the color of the vehicles respond to light, we can adjust the light in the suit. And then we also have a lot of our freestand light as well. So you'll see it in our correction videos. It really just makes things so much easier. Now, you're not really seeing much paint defects through the outer dirt of this Defender. You'll be seeing a video on that soon. That'll probably be the next one up after this, or maybe the, the one after that. But I tend to like working at this side, and Stevie works at that side. You can see the floors getting pretty tired. And that is one of our plans for 2024, is to redo this whole floor. Now, the other building that you'll see, we did epoxy resin on. It looks really cool. But for back here, we're probably just going to tile this, make it. Plain, simple, easy to maintain. And then we're also going to put a scissor lift back here, which is going to also tie in with one of our new services, which is going to be dry ice cleaning. We have our light up sign at the back, which we are getting another one of those made up for the other building as well. So you'll be familiar enough with this area all the time. And then we also have all of our storage. That's where we keep all of our products, our machines, etc. A lot of our lighting, our handheld lighting, etc. And then that, which you would see or have never seen before in the videos, really, that's our sort of heavy chemical store where we keep our 25 litres of uh, drums of stuff and then some of our equipment that we don't use all the time, like steam cleaners, stuff like that that would stay away. And then also, I should point out, if you see these doors at the back, that is our customer's toilet. And then we have at the back there, sort of staff room, kitchen area, and another toilet for us as well. And then this is where you'll often see us do our wet work. Now, one of our recent additions, although we're off at that, we did put more overhead lighting up here because sometimes, just the way things work out, sometimes we end up doing a bit of paint correction back here, or up here, I should say, and it wasn't really ideal. We have some of these little spots and stuff in the wall as well. We will be adding more lighting to this area as well, but this is generally where we do all of our wet work. So whenever we... You'll see whenever we finish washing the cars, we bring them in, dry them off here, let them drip dry, 
um, basically it means that they're ready then to move to the back after that. And this really is a good time to introduce one of our first project cars. This car has been in my family for a long, long time. This was my dad's car, so it's kind of a family heirloom and it has sort of a real special place in my heart. And I realize that actually makes it sound like he is no longer with us, but I can assure you he's very much alive and kicking. But this car has a real special place in my heart. We originally got this whenever I still work for Philip. This was traded in. It was still a pretty fresh car at the time. And as soon as I seen it, I knew my dad would love it. He, like me, has a huge love for BMWs, particularly BMWs of this era. And he drove this car as his daily driver for years and years and years. And then he decided that he would sell it because it was starting to get on a bit, starting to need some repairs. A mechanic that he used at the time sort of put it in his head that you should maybe change this now because it's going to need a bit of upkeep. And he bought something fresher, instantly regretted it. And then I spotted it up for sale probably a year and a half, two years down the line. And we went and bought it back again. At that stage, it had become a little disheveled from the car it was whenever he had it. And he rectified all of the things and then decided again to sell it after having it for a while. He's a bit like me. We love changing cars. And I think the pursuit and the idea of getting a new car got the better off him. Plus, again, it was starting to need a bit of maintenance and he got it changed for something fresh again. And I did warn him he would regret it, and regret it he did. And then on a local car forum that I am a member of called RMS Motoring, this actually came up as a member's car. So a guy had bought it, put a member's thread up on it, and I instantly begged him to sell it to me. We brought my dad up, went to surprise him with the car, and he was delighted to get it back again. And it was pressed back into daily service again. And he drove it again for a few years. But at this stage, it really was starting to get a bit long in the tooth for daily driving. And also, it was annoying him that, you know, using it, putting miles on it. It meant so much to us as a family. So it was time to retire it. I managed to find him a lovely E-Class convertible. And he very kindly donated this to me. Unfortunately, I have had no time to do anything with it. And it's been lying outside. And as you'll see... It has got a bit untidy, a bit dishevelled, but I knew this was going to be a restoration project. Finally, I have the time and space to get it inside and start doing something with it. So you're going to probably see this on the channel quite a bit if it's something that you guys would be interested in. Go do a full restoration on it and a little bit of modifying because I can't leave cars alone. Now, between us having it the last time and getting it back, somebody had put a really horrible set of coilovers in it. It drives not as good as it used to and the coilovers are, are toast now so we're going to put some lowering springs and some decent shocks in it and then we're going to put some alpina wheels we did originally put an alpina lower front spoiler on this um, and we actually put the rear lip spoiler it didn't have one of those originally i think that was one of the first things we did to the car when when he had first got it was put that little m sport lip spoiler on it um, but yeah, I'm going to put 19 inch Alpine wheels on it, coils and springs. I really wanted to change the interior in this car because it's something I've never liked about it, but it's kind of part of it now. And that is, it is blue inside. And I mean, it is blue carpet, seats, plastics. Oh, I've never seen another one like it. It is so blue. And I had thought about putting black interior trims and cream leather seats in this, but it's kind of a shame to, it's, it's part of the car's identity at this stage. So I'm just going to give everything a real good deep clean up. I'm going to get the steering wheel redone because after 130k, it's starting to wear away, as you can imagine. But it's hold, held up incredibly well. BMWs this generation, this is when they were just built properly. Feels so solid to drive. I say it needs a bit of mechanical work at this stage. Engine, gearbox, all reasonably good. It's a 520i, so I'm not exactly brisk in the speed department, but it's so smooth with that big six. But it is popping out of second gear occasionally, so we're going to need to do something. Probably put a second gearbox in it. 
and then a damn good service and as I say swap out a lot of the suspension because the suspension is quite hard and there's quite a lot of knocks and rattles and bangs I was driving this about as a daily for a little while and that's why I sort of put it to bed it was getting near the end of MOT and there's a bit of paintwork and stuff to do on it the first video we'll do with this car is doing a deep clean and then an assessment of it and then we'll probably do some of the mechanicals get the wheels and then get a bit of paint and then do a proper proper paint correction on this coat it the whole heap and then i might uh, put a sound system in this i have a aftermarket double din screen to go into it and then uh, something i like in my cars is good quality sounds but it's got very green from sitting you'll have seen it in the background when we're doing our wash videos it's sat outside for probably the better part of a year which is criminal and it's not something i would normally do with any of my cars um but i knew that this was going to be a huge project so i kind of let it get a bit neglected i feel a bit bad about that but yeah so that's car number one so now we'll take you down to our other building the showroom and you can see the rest of our stuff down there This building is my happy place. It is the realization of a dream that I had many, many years ago before I ever left employment to venture out on my own. And well, it's not quite the full realized dream yet. There's still a lot of work to do with this building. Now we've had this building for years and whenever we first took it on, it was a completely bare concrete shell. It used to belong to a place that serviced oil boilers and it was an absolute mess. And for years, all we used it for was simply, I would have parked my own vehicles in here. And then quite often what we get is people will get a car detailed and it may not go out as soon as it's done. It'll maybe stay about for a few days or weeks or sometimes even months. And likewise, people will often drop them in early ahead of getting them done. So we've always had this building as a secure, safe place so that we're not leaving cars out in the car park, etc. They can be shut away. And well, I never liked bringing customers into here because it really was an utter mess. And likewise, keeping the workshop in a presentable condition that you can bring customers in and, and not have them sort of looking at a bit of a messy environment and also keeping cars dust free that have been sitting and finished and then we're machining other vehicles automatically there's dust in there. The cars will get dusty sitting about. So the plan was let's transform this into something that would enhance your experience. You know, if you're getting your car detailed, you obviously love your car. Um, you love cars in general quite a lot of the time and it's a pretty reasonable amount of money to invest so we thought we would add to the experience so that's how this building was born now it has went hugely over budget so far but it's still a long way from finish what we've done so far epoxy resin the floor that was crazy expensive but i think it really adds to the ambience in the building i think it really really looks fantastic and it's something that customers comment on all the time then we put up the custom lighting behind us the the halos and then what to do the hex grid thing that's kind of played out now in my opinion same with the the sort of tiled floor that you would see in a lot of places i wanted to stand out and do something a bit different so everything in here has been geared towards that we have a lighting structure that's going up at the front of the building which is the area we park cars in to do the actual handover that's been all custom made we've almost that side of things finished and then it's just a lot more signage and stuff you see we've got some of the cool um led neon style signs up with a few more things like that to go up but i don't want to give away too much because quite often we get copied so i i want to be the first to do these things and then we can share them with the world but other things that we did in here built a little office area it used to be just a small sort of cupboard under the stairs basically what we use as a storage cupboard in the other building and we knocked half the wall down put in a glass window um, then we plastered inside there and that is going to give a nice view for customers out over the showroom and i think it's just all going to add up to being a nice experience whenever you 
come to collect your car. And there's always something cool sitting in here. Cars that are here at the minute, unbelievable. Porsche 911 GT3 RS, Wysak Pack, Lizard Green, absolutely amazing. We'll be doing a video on this car. You'll see that, no doubt, in the coming weeks. And then the little Beetle, that is something that we're doing a full restoration type detail on. And that's something that just shows you the vast scope of the differences of what we do here. It can be a supercar, it can be a classic, and it can be anything in between. But the main thing, and the thing I get so much enjoyment with, is I'm around such a diverse range of cars all the time. It really feeds the car nerd in me. So then what about my other cars? Well, let's show you around them, see what you think. So this is my baby. This is my forever, ever, ever car. There is no amount of money in the world would buy this car off me. And it's the longest car I've ever owned. Had it seven years, maybe a little over seven years now. And it's my 06 Cayman. Now this is a base 2.7 car. The story when I bought this car was this was only meant to be like a stopgap car. I always owned the 46 M3s. And this was a try something else because I had so many 46 M3s. And I always wondered a Porsche. I love Porsches. I'd love an air-cooled car, but they are in the stratosphere price ways. And I came and I had driven. Uh, a friend had owned one, and I thought it just was incredible to drive. I had a 996, 911, and I didn't really enjoy the driving experience of it versus the E46 M3. So I set out to find a 2.7 because I wanted to avoid any of the engine problems, especially because I didn't plan on keeping this car in any length of time. I wanted a special color, and I wanted one that had every bit of spec. So it took quite a while to find. This is a speed yellow car. When I bought it, it had 27,000 miles on it. There are now around 55 or maybe even 60,000 miles now. And I bought this as a standard car, and they've done a huge amount of modifications too. First thing I did was lower it, so H&R springs. This is the PASM dampers. So I've got another thing that's called a DSC Sport Controller, which essentially turns the PASM into a full adaptive suspension setup. It is absolutely phenomenal. Then it's got a tube exhaust. We have intakes. It's been remapped by TMC Motorsport. And that has really just tied all those mods together. And then um, one of the last things I did mechanically was fit a Quaif limited slip differential. And then I have some numeric racing the quick shift kit in it. Pretty much mechanically, that's most of it done. A few other things that I did, I fit out a GT3 master cylinder, it gives you better pedal feel, and then everything underneath, all the aero stuff underneath is GT3 for the brake ducts as well. The only other things I really plan on doing is maybe putting brake, actually I've already done it, I've already got the brake lines fitted this, so that mechanically that is this car done. Maybe someday, way down the line, I would like to do a 3.8 swap in it. The thing I love about this car is it feels fast with the urgency of the engine, but it's not really fast. So you can actually really, really enjoy wringing the neck out of this thing and not you know, getting into any trouble really in terms of speed, etc. Other mods, I like my cars being performance based. So I do have a rear roll cage in the car and I fitted some Recaro pole position seats to it in uh, when I ordered those seats, you could order them in the same leather as, as what the car would have had from the factory. So it's trimmed in the black Porsche leather. They look mega. They look factory on the car. Only other thing I'd like to do to this car is fit a set of Cayman R wheels to it. They are like hen's teeth. And all the time I've had this car, I've been looking out for a set. And I missed one. I've never seen another set come up. And, well, they're a fortune to buy new, like an absolute fortune. The wheels in this really do need refurbed at this point though, so I'll probably get that done over this winter period. And aside from that, the only other things I've really done with the car, styling wise, the front bumper, I color coded the washer jets, I fitted the GT3 RS lower splitter, I fitted the Zoom Sport um, metal grills, and then the GT3 upper vent. And then the rear of the car, we have fitted a GT4 style spoiler, it's in carbon, then I had it custom painted and then fit it these really cool tail lights that just make it look like the 9987.2 lights. I'm pretty much done with this other than a bit more interior trim. I would like to do the steering wheel in Alcantara, um, same with the gear knob and the handbrake. 
um, then it'll just be a case of keeping it clean, tidy, and just using and enjoying the car as much as possible. I do get it out a lot every summer over the summer. Um, even sometimes in winter, I'm not overly precious about my cars. That way I will use them whenever the notion takes me. But I love this car. There is no money could ever make me part of this. And now my beautiful little Mini. I love this car so, so much. I started life as a 95 Rover Cooper, but as you can see, there's not really much of that original car left over. Now, I have had minis for years. If you've seen earlier in the video, I had one as my first ever car, and I've built quite a few of them over the years since. And the last one I had, I don't know, it just didn't do much for me. I never really finished it completely, but it actually left me thinking I'd maybe just grew out of minis. I ended up buying another one subsequently after that that had been restored to a lovely standard, but it wasn't quite to my taste and it just never drove right. It was on 13 inch wheels, the suspension setup was very low and it just didn't drive like a Mini. And if you have never driven a Mini before, you really should make a point of it because a well sorted one is the closest thing you'll get to driving a go-kart on the road. The handling is hilarious on them, so responsive. There's just a, an awesome little car and well, this one I seen for sale right at the very southern point of England and I made a bit of a road trip getting the car and when I got there and the guy I'd met me at the airport with it, as soon as I laid eyes on this car, it was love at first sight and I just hoped that the driving experience and stuff would live up to what I originally remember, all of the fun that I had in minis over the years and it did. So I did a road trip home through the Cotswolds Stopped at Caffeine and Machine, just really had an awesome, memorable trip, and it cemented this little car as a special place for me. Now, I have done a lot with this styling wise. It's pretty much as I got it, with the exception of I put the Lucas fog lamp covers on. I thought they were much nicer than the ones that were fitted to it. And I put the black and silver plates on. I've detailed it, ceramic coated it. I do have a few other mods planned for the car that should be here soon. One of which is I'm replacing the fuel, fuel filler cap with an Aston style cap and then changing those back lights for the Mark II style. I just think they'll add to that sort of retro vibe the car has. And then I would like to put a half roll cage in, paint it in body colour. And really that's about it. I would maybe, and I'm sort of exploring options with it at the moment, like to have a really, you know, a nice engine put in this. Something like Supercharged 1380 or you know, something with around 120 horsepower. But one of the things I really love about this car is it is mega reliable. So it's a single point injection car. You've no carbs to worry about. It just goes first turn of the key and I would drive this anywhere and not worry about reliability. And once you go down the route of tuning them, well, you kind of lose that a bit. So the car though, I think it's styled to absolute perfection. The color combination is amazing. The stance of those little fat six by 10 inch mini lights, the car just sits oh so right. And the interior, while it wouldn't normally be to my taste, the wood really complements the rest of the car. Originally, I would have probably planned on putting the oval center clock dash into this, but the wood just ties in nicely. And the red carpet, which can look quite garish in photographs and on video, when you see it in person, it just looks so utterly perfect. Now, one thing I will be changing about the interior, it has the Cobra style bucket seats in it, but they are copies and they are so uncomfortable for any sort of distance driving. So I'm just going to be replacing those with the genuine Cobra ones because I've had those in other minis and they've been perfectly comfortable for long driving. And really, that's going to be it. It's just going to be about improving upon what's already here. The restoration was done in this car in 2014, so inevitably it is a mini and there's a few little just little hints of rust starting here and there and you need to keep on top of it with a mini or you're going to end up with another restoration project. So over the winter we'll get this shipped off to the body shop and get those bits and pieces tidied up. But really I just want to enjoy this car as much as possible over the good weather. This is the one I am precious about. I will not take this out in the summer or in the, in the winter time because salt is just really corrosive and it's just not worth it with an old car like this. So there's a lot of cleaning to do underneath it. I have a lot of cleaning to do under the bonnet, but the car is of a really, really good standard so far. And I'm just going to enjoy tinkering with this 
as time goes on. I say it's a forever car. It's going to always need improvement um, somewhere along the line. Silly things like this chrome trim around the, the windscreen and the rear screen has faded. So we'll get the little tool and new strips of those and replace them. And then it's just, we'll be keeping on top of the bright work. The rear boot lamp's pretty, pretty tired looking. So for all the price of the parts for these, so cheap. We we'll just put a new one of those on there, but I am already missing driving this. Um, it'll be really tempting if we get a really sort of dry spell even in winter to just take it out. But I don't want to end up with a rusty mini. So yeah, so that's really as much as I'm going to be doing with this little car. It doesn't need much more improvement. I just, if you've never owned a mini, I can't recommend it. If you want a classic car, these really are hard to beat. Now, prices of them have got pretty silly in the last few years compared to what they were worth whenever I first get into them, but that's the nature of most things. But parts are cheap. They're relatively simple to work on. Uh, they look great. They're fun to drive. Uh, what more can I say? They're absolutely incredible. So that kind of brings you up to date with the cars I have now. And three cars that are all keeper cars and then you'll have seen my daily smoker my l322 range rover on the channel before so that really is my entire fleet at the moment <clears throat> usually i'll have a, a, a silly sports car amongst it all i've had an aston martin vantage i had a maserati gran turismo and normally there'd be something like that kicking about they get replaced with an m4 which i absolutely loved and really regret selling but i can only keep so many cars and I like to keep one constantly moving. It lets that little car dealer that's buried deep within that little boy that wanted to be one have a bit of time to, to play with that type of thing. And that means I get the experience quite a few other cars. I would love, dearly, dearly love a Ferrari, but I just can't justify the expense of one of those. Certainly if I did buy one, it definitely wouldn't be a long-term purchase. It would be something to enjoy and I would be selling it on almost immediately. The way the economy's going, don't think next year is going to be the year for that but i'm certainly going to enjoy all the cars i have and we have lots of room for improvement with each one of them so if you'd like to see more of this type of thing on the channel please comment below just let us know what sort of content you want to see obviously we're a detailing based channel but i am an out and out petrol head and my life outside of work is also constantly messing about with cars so if you'd like to see more of that type of thing let us know and we would be more than happy to oblige. No doubt come summer, there'll be a few more purchases made, no doubt, and we'll document them as well. But for now, what can I say? Hopefully this has given you an insight into the mind of a crazy uh, car nut. I love my job, my business. This crazy car world has introduced me to my best friends. I've just, it was the right life choice. Never will be rich, but I'm happy and that's all that matters. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to the channel and we'll catch you again in another video.